I want to start to int introduce Josina Michelle, who's joining us from Johannesburg, South Africa. Josina is a long-standing human rights defender. Through the Kaluka movement, she is helping to accelerate social change on gender-based relationships and create safe havens for survivors of violence in communities across southern Africa. She is also a co-founder of Her Life Project to provide services and support for women in emergency situations. As the daughter of Grassa and Samora Michelle and the stepdaughter of Nelson Mandela, she was born into a legacy of activism and is passionate in her calling to advance women's rights. She serves on a number of international boards, including the Grasha Michelle Trust, the ABC Atlas Mara in Mozambique, the Emerald Group, and the Sicily Institute for Child Development. She also serves as the director of the Samora Michelle Documa Documentation Center. First applause for Josina joining us. We. Uh, we did a test run this morning, and I was in my bathrobe having a cup of coffee, and we actually saw each other. I wish that you could see me now. It's, it's much, much better. Uh, you're in a... <laughs> I'll just tell you a bit, since Josina can't see us, uh, we can see you. I just want to describe the room for you so you know where you are. You are at the uh, Evergreen Brickworks in Toronto. Uh, you're in a room with about 150 people. I am sure that you have many friends in this room, but one I know for sure is Peggy Dulaney. Peggy is here, and, uh, and a lot of other people that want to hear from you from around the world. We have uh, indigenous leaders from across Canada. We have older people and youth in our gathering. We have a pretty big delegation from uh, South Africa, uh, mostly through uh, Synergos. I thought you'd like to, to know that as well. And uh, from other countries in Africa, a lot of my former students are in this room. And we have leaders from NGOs, from technology, from universities, from civil society, and just amazing individuals who wanted to be here and share with us, including many artists and creative people. So once again, welcome. I've just given uh, an introduction to you, which, you've, which, you, uh, which is really from your, your biography, and particularly uh, focusing on the Kaluka uh, Trust, and, uh, and a little bit about your background as a long-standing human rights uh, defender. I, I would also like to say that uh, if, you, if you could have only one word in the dictionary to to describe what resilience is, it would be Josina Michelle. Now, a lot of people who know Josina's story might not find that surprising at all, but I want to add one other word. If you look up in the dictionary a one-word definition of the word grace, you would also see Josina Michelle. So welcome to you. I'm going to, uh, I've got a few questions for you, and, and I'll start with the first question, but also feel free to just go where you want to go with this, yeah? So uh, if that makes sense, uh, um, once again, good morning and welcome to you. Good morning, Kim, and good morning from a very sunny Johannesburg to everybody. Well, we can't claim that. We've had great sun for a couple of days, and now it's, uh, it's fairly uh, bleak and rainy, except for this ray of sunshine well, you're giving us. And in I this hope, room. I hope through this conversation I can just um, shed a bit of the warmth and the heat from this part of the world. Thank you. Much appreciated. So I'm going to begin with the, uh, the first question. And, and again, if we don't get to the others, don't worry. And if we do, that's fine too. Let's just see where we go. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. Josina, you are a tireless and skilled advocate for survivors yeah. from violence in war and of domestic violence. You are a champion for women, in particular. Would you speak to us about your life's mission and the journey that brought you to this mission? Kim, um, I believe I started um, fighting for the rights, uh, stand up and fighting for the rights of women when I was very young. Um, I always wanted to be in the space of healing, and I thought that 
if I managed to be a psychologist and uh, a dancer at the same time, I would open up to heal. Uh, I would open up the opportunities for women to heal in different ways. Um, so throughout my university years, um, that is what I, I work towards. Uh, I graduated from the London School of Economics with a gender, um, with a major in gender. And uh, I then started working uh, always in the area of development with uh, intent with women. But I guess uh, the universe and life wanted something different from me. Although I had worked and studied um, and spoken to women who were survivors of violence 10, 15 years ago, I never imagined that one day I would be put in that position. And on the day that that happened, I was savagely um, beaten. And as a consequence, I lost my eye, my right eye. Um, but then as a consequence of that, I got a stronger focus and an understanding of what I wanted to do. Through my journey, I was then able to understand what are actually the needs, the rights, and the struggles, the everyday struggles that uh, victims of violence go through. And while I did my journey um, into becoming a survivor, I then decided that, well, if I had the privilege to do that, I had to also allow millions of women in the world um, to do that. So that is how I started then the Kutluka movement, which is specific for victims and survivors of violence, so that we, we, we advocate for the rights, the needs, but we also provide very real concrete solutions and services for women on the ground. And so it was a painful experience that brought me into actually focusing specifically on healing and regenerating uh, women that have been abused. Thank you. I'll just, uh, I'll just carry on if that's all right with you because I think this all flow, flows together. In this symposium, we are exploring what it means to enshrine the right to belong. We are looking at belonging as a state of wholeness, the experience of being secure at home, in the social environment, organizational, and cultural context of one's life. How do you see your work relating to this work of building belonging? And what are the most effective strategies for building belonging? In our work, we come across um, issues, of course, of belonging and isolation. Um, because it is a very uh, unique experience, a very solitary and painful experience. And so, um, in spite of the fact that we are there to stand for the other women, for, for women, and we do the journey with them, we are very conscious of the fact that there is a huge sense of isolation and inability to belong. Belonging is not just the physical space that we'll be talking. Belonging is actually the well-being within us, is knowing that we are because we are. And that is one of the aspects that, you know, women in general do not learn from the beginning of their life. You know, women are born into a world that is already discriminatory. Um, and they have to start from the very beginning. You know, they see their brothers, for example, playing around, but they have to be cooking. They, um, when they grow up, they have to see the parents making choices, real choices on the ground, that are whether they go to school or not. So the sense of belonging, and, um, or rather, or the sense of being, and being comfortable with oneself, the sense of feeling fulfilled and whole is something that gets chipped in as we grow. So you can imagine then with someone who has been stripped of the dignity, someone who has been stripped of everything that is known to be real, um, the sense of isolation is even bigger. So part of the work that we do is also to build up this sense of belonging, knowing that you are fine, you are who you are, and you don't need to justify your existence. What was the next question, Kim? Yeah, that's uh, that. I just I, before we go to that, I just wanted to uh, to pick up on when you're talking about safety, and uh, for for everyone, but particularly we're talking now about women. And 
And I was thinking as you were speaking about rights, because we're looking at, at this very much in the context of rights. I look at belonging as a right that we are born with by simple virtue of the fact that we were born. And it's, there's a legal, a legal component, a moral component, and a social and cultural component. But you know, when people have their rights, whichever rights or combination of rights denied over and over again, systemically it's hard sometimes to believe that you actually have that right, not just that society has that right. And when you were talking about safety, and, and, and I would put it in the context of the right, our right to be safe, I wondered what you think about something else I've thought about this a lot in, in my life because I've had some times when I wasn't safe, definitely was not safe in a physical situation. But after that, um, I thought to myself that I actually needed not only to be safe, but to feel safe. And feeling safe inside, because that's where all of this begins, and that th this, this incident for me was actually called my marriage. Uh, and, uh, and after that, I thought, well, I'm, I'm safe. I'm safe now physically, but I don't feel safe. It took a long time to feel safe. And it seems to me that the work that you're doing, and I've had the opportunity to, to, work, to work with you or to start to get working with you uh, and feel very honored to, to do so, is that the resilience that you are uh, I would say empowering or re-empowering women with after, after all, all of their rights and dignity in, in, in a moment or series of moments has been taken away that they need, we all need, the, the, that feeling of comfort and safety and well-being uh, often loaned to us uh, forever um, and uh, most acutely in, uh, in the recovery and that it's not just about being safe it's also about feeling safe, and I just wondered if, if that resonated with you. Certainly. Um, you know, Kim, uh, if we look at um, the beginning of women's lives, right, um, you are at your home with your parents, but many of us have our innocence already uh, stripping away from us in those, belong in those sense, I mean, at that stage. If we're looking particularly at, um, let's even not look at women who have been abused in the sense of physical abuse. But you know, when we look at issues of sexual harassment in the workplace, that already starts stripping your sense of belonging and safety because you don't know how safe you are and for how long. And then imagine someone who has been abused. And thank you for you having for you having shared your story. And of course, I shared mine. You know, the, the issue of trauma um, and the issue of unsafety is something that goes on for years and years. The tendency is to think that, well, perhaps you've been taken away from that threatening and abusive environment, but it takes years until you're comfortable with yourself and what your surroundings are. It takes long for one woman to be safe, for example, in a car. It takes long for women to be in their own house and feel complete safe. So the issue of safety is really very relative, but it is something that women learn to claim and learn to aim, I mean, to, be, to it's, it's to claim and to have um, as time goes by. We can't take it just literally, as you're saying, that you know, physical safe, safety is guaranteed, but your internal safety, your emotional safety, um, if it hasn't been built up, there's nothing, much, there's nothing much you can do. In the work that I do, I come across many women who actually have to be taught to be safe. I think yeah. that's uh, really, really key uh, to, to what we've been talking about the last, the last few days. Uh, in, uh, in the way that we can support one another. Sometimes we're the caregiver. Uh, sometimes we're a recipient of care. Usually in our lives, it's a combination of both. But I think you would agree with me that there's no time limit on how long healing takes <laughs> and how long kindness is required. Yes, definitely. Um, and you know, uh, uh, it's unfortunate that um, 
millions of women in this world only are able to realize that once they have gone through the worst. And unfortunately, many die in the process, you know, and before they actually they, they, they realize that. But it's part of who uh, it's part of the work that we do, and um, you know, ensuring that all women um, and of course men as well have to now be taught and be very conscious of the actions and the impact that it has. Because healing, as 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 we know, and the people in this room know, healing is a lifelong process. You know, I have been a survivor of violence for the past four years, but there are times when um, I don't feel much like a survivor. I still go back into feelings of victimhood. Um, I still go into the doubt, into the pain, go through small little triggers that put me back at the beginning of my journey. So being a survivor is perhaps being living consciously of your surroundings and your own emotions, your needs, and your own safety. And so you work consciously every single day to continue to feed that, that, that positivity and the need to be courageous, but also be vulnerable enough to enjoy life. Yeah, that, uh, that answers uh, the, the other part of the, the uh, second question, which are effective strategies for building belonging. And I think that you've, you've expressed a lot of, a lot of that in what you've, you've just said. I, I wanted to uh, then follow up with, uh, how do you see the relationship between belonging and resilience? If we know that, or if we agree that resilience is the ability to um, go through extreme deprivation, pain, and destruction, but being able to build from there, um, I would say that the, the, the connection between the two um, is not automatic because in order for you to be resilient, you need to be very comfortable with who you are. You need to learn and to be comfortable with who you are, which then it means a very conscious process of actually building that. So you, 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 build, um, your, you build yourself, you, you go through a number of exercises and go through life in general to ensure that you, you know who you are, you're comfortable with that, you claim that, the space around you, and I mean the space, I mean the people around you recognize that. And if they don't, well, they at least accept it one way or the other. And then from it, um, from that sense of belonging in knowing who you are, then you're able to build your resilience. Yeah. Thank you very much. I have one more question, which I'll ask and then ask you to wrap up with anything else that you want to share with us. But my last official question uh, is, looking to your life's work and your life experience, what do you believe it would mean to enshrine a right to belong? I think the very first one is that all of us as human beings recognize that we here, um, we have the privilege of life. And it is a privilege both for men and women we need to respect ourselves and be able to respect others. If we are able to do that, we then able to allow us to be and allow others to be, which then means allowing us to belong and others to belong and, spay and, and, and share the sacred space that is the world and is our life. Now, that needs to be very conscious. Um, as I was saying before, it's not automatic. We need to do that both for girls and for boys, and so that all of them grow with that same sense. And look, as part of my work, of course, it's, um, it challenges us um, to ensure that women are valued. People look at, at women um, and respect, but they know that, you know, they value, they, 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 they worthy, they, they are deserving, just like any other human being, like just like men are. I mean, at the end of the day, we come into this world in the same way. Our blood is red, the milk that we have is white. Um, and until someone pinpoints that you are a girl and you're a boy, you just don't know, you are being in this world. 
And so that is the kind of work that we need to continue doing so that we have um, people that are comfortable with who they are. Once they're comfortable with who they are, they will be comfortable with others and respect the otherness. I think there are few religions, for example, that from the beginning say, you know, we are, I am because you are, and I honor the you in you. And once we all able to do that, um, we would have we, we, we would have reached uh, quite a, a different way of being, belonging, and and sharing this world. Now, um, as part of my work, you know, it's not automatic, um, but it is part of the things that we do, speci specifically when we are working with women who have been abused, with women who are raising children, because it is very difficult to be in a broken place or believing in a broken world and having to raise children. Because your duty is actually to ensure that your child does not inherit the trauma and the negative view of the world that you might have. So that is something that forces um, women in particular, women who have been abused and are raising a whole new generation, to be very, very conscious of it and to say, Every day I will wake up and make sure that my child does not feel the pain that I'm going through. If every other woman can do that, and every other woman is in a place where they are able to pass that, that sense of consciousness and existence, I believe we would have gone, we would be able to go quite a, quite a, a far way. Yeah. Bravo to that. I think we should clap for that. <laughs> that we, uh, we've been talking a, a lot about uh, what is it that we value, which I, I feel is the heart, the heart of, of belonging or lack of belonging or othering or not othering people, and ultimately based on respect, recognition, and reciprocity. And I agree very much about the, uh, the way that trauma can be passed down and, and how we, we need to be healed. The one person we know we can heal, we have the biggest capacity to heal is ourselves and then, and then take that out into the world. I, I wanted to just ask you, uh, Josina, is there anything else? You shared so much, so there doesn't have to be anything else, but is there anything else that you'd like to share with us today? I would like to share with you, um, I have shared with you and I have shared with Peggy and I'm sure other friends in the room, but I would like you to, I would like to offer a just very small glimpse into the work that I do. So we, we work specifically with uh, victims of gender-based violence and it's um, in providing services uh, for the, for, for, to enable the healing. And one of the things that, Kim, I think you would like very much to see is that we are doing the distribution of the dignity packs. So these, these are boxes that we provide for women who have been abused. And it is given in police stations and in medical centers right in the first 24 hours after the abuse. What does it mean? Some of us reach these places in a very um, undignified way. Um, many of us go to these places without clothes, without shoes, or our clothes have been torn apart. We are bleeding. And the first, and we have to stay in those places and report in some of the most undignified conditions. So with this dignity pack that Kim, you have been um, an enabler you know, for for the thousands that we have we have distributed here in Africa, in South Africa, and in Mozambique, what it what it really does is to give a bit of comfort at that woman for for immediately at that point. And this box is composed then of a kapulana, which is a sitenge. It's um, essential items such as flip flops. Um, interior clothing, because sometimes if you've been raped, you need to leave forensic evidence behind. It's pads if you bring. So basically, those kind of things that will give you some comfort and dignity um, in that moment, in that undignified moment. And we've got in it a small booklet that actually explains the journey of that is about to start. Rather, it's the journey that these women are about to embark. 
So in this small one, in this, um, I don't know if you can see there, it's a small booklet yeah. that basically talks about your rights so that they know what are their rights, how should they be treated by the police, what they should demand, because it's important for every woman at time of crisis, knowing that you have rights and you can demand that. If we go through possible emotions that they could go through, and of course then telling, um, you know, of the other possibilities of what happens afterwards. So we do the dignity packs and we distribute um, around that. The feedback is amazing. There are many women that have cried in this, in the, in the, once they received it and they couldn't believe, you know, that there is something that could give their comfort. We then also work in communities, um, being in the workplace or just in, in, in normal communities, where we created the circles of support. The circles of support are places where 20 women meet at a time, they share their story, they get counseling. Um, family members and friends can also participate because not always uh, families and friends are equipped to know um, how to deal with the survival of violence. So they come in, they share knowledge, we give also um, advice on what to do, where to go, and so on and so forth. And it's going amazingly, both in the workplace, or it's starting to grow amazingly in the workplace and in the community. And then, of course, the big dream is one day to uh, be able to build shelters where this woman can have safe space for actually healing. Thank you. And it, what? Thank you so much for sharing, Josina, and I'd, I'd be happy for everyone here, because I bet everyone here will be interested to learn more, to, uh, to connect them with you and your team, uh, or, uh, or also to, pr to provide a, any information on our website, we can do that as well. Uh, what I love about y your work is that it addresses the, the medical needs, the dignity need, the safety need, the health need, the family support need, so families know how to be there for that woman in that time, to provide peer support, and underneath it all, to, be love, to provide love and caring and respect. Families and friends um, in day fabric is never the same once they've dealt with GBV. Um, you know, the fabric of the, 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 the family changes automatically the dynamics change automatically so they need to also be empowered to be able to do this journey because they might not be direct victims and survivors but they are indirect victims and survivors of violence mm -hmm. and that and you address this holistically we have to well i just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart and i know everyone feels the same so get ready for a huge round of applause and thank you thank you thank you <laughs>